In the last module, we had been focusing on arguments that critical thinking can really have this very positive impact on your lives by helping you to make better decisions or form more highly events or true beliefs at particular inflection points in your life, it can have this dramatic cumulative effect on your overall well-being. And then I noted that that isn't the only thing that we should be thinking about, that we should be thinking about the benefits of critical thinking along other contexts, and we should be more nuanced in our understanding of forming beliefs or making decisions. And that's what we want to do in this module. So let's just take a moment and think about decisions or choices. Now, we were assuming that there were really two kinds of choices. There were optimal choices that have positive value, and there were suboptimal choices that all had the same negative value, or at least all had negative value. But that really isn't how life works. Sometimes there are no optimal choices. Sometimes we have to choose among an array of less desirable, less perfect choices. But that doesn't mean that we can't make a better choice. So we can think of an optimal choice or a decision as one which minimizes risk or collateral damage while maximizing value. So it's gets the best ratio of risk to value. Suboptimal decisions then fail to get that best ratio, but that doesn't mean that they're all equally good or bad or that they're all bad. And so we can introduce a different notion, a notion of satisficing decisions. Now, satisficing decisions are decisions that all meet a minimum threshold of risk to value. In other words, they are satisfactory or better. They don't have to be optimal. They just have to be better than their alternatives. And so if we think about what it is that we want to do when we make decisions or choices, well, ideally, we'd like to make optimal decisions or choices, but we'll still have a much better life if we manage to make satisfying decisions, decisions that are better than the competitors, even if they aren't the best that we could possibly make. And we can think about this in terms of, for instance, things like our health choices. So the recommendation for exercise for people is about 150 minutes of moderate exercise every week. Now, that basically breaks down to something like 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And so you may find that you oftentimes just don't have the ability to make that optimal choice of exercising 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And so you might think, well, look, I can make that optimal choice or I can't, I can't really do it. It's not practicable for me, I'm too busy, etc." Well, then it's not the case that the only decision you're gonna be able to make if you don't do that 150 minutes is not exercising or exercising uh, randomly without really devoting much effort to it. It turns out that while it's better to exercise about 150 minutes of moderate intensity, even exercising less, say 70 minutes a week, 10 minutes a day, seven days a week, that still increases your overall life expectancy, it increases your overall cognitive facilities, it increases your overall sense of well-being, it improves your cardiovascular health, it helps to uh, eliminate or lower causes, uh, the potential for cancers, and so on, right? So even though you're making a suboptimal decision, you're not doing that 150 minutes, if you can just make a better decision, if you can just do a little bit more, then it will actually give you benefits. Our decisions about what and how much we eat or how often we exercise are nice illustrations of satisfying decisions. That is, decisions that we can make that aren't necessarily the optimal decision, but that nevertheless represent a better choice. And of course, all the things that we're saying apply in the opposite direction. So, for example, in the textbook, I uh, use Columbus Day 
as an example of a decision that really is a bad decision, that there really isn't any good reasons to suppose that we should be establishing a federal holiday to honor Columbus. He didn't really discover America. He didn't realize it was a continent. He was a colonizing exploiter of the indigenous population. He was wrong about the circumference of the earth and so on and so on and so on. Right? Um, so when we look at the other side of our satisficing criterion, there are some decisions that just don't even meet that minimum threshold. So not everyone will agree on what holidays we should have and why. But some holidays clearly just don't meet the threshold. They aren't the sort of thing that we should be legislating as time off to honor something. So just as our understanding of decisions should be more nuanced, our understanding of forming of beliefs should also be more nuanced. So true beliefs are great. They're accurate representations of the world. They guide our actions in a way that reflects the real nature of the world and hence is more likely to be adaptive. But that doesn't mean that true beliefs are the only beliefs that we should be striving to form. Because oftentimes, we're not in a position to definitively decide whether or not something is true or false. And this is perfectly exemplified by science. So the idea here is that scientists aren't trying to form true beliefs simplicity. What they're trying to do is figure out what the best events belief is in their scientific epoch. And so we can think of highly or well events beliefs as beliefs that have high levels of intersubjectively verifiable evidence supporting it. So that if you form a belief that's highly events or well events, it's a belief for which everyone can see the good evidence in support of that belief. And intersubjectively verifiable evidence is just evidence that consists of data that other people could have or could check. So that it's not a subjective criterion, it's an intersubjective criterion. And so when we think about Newton's law of universal gravitation, that's a nice example of a well-events belief that turned out not to be true, but nevertheless was a good belief to have. So in the 17th century, when Newton published his work, he introduced this law. Now, this law was well events. There were good reasons to suppose that this was a good law about universal gravitation. And it was incredibly useful and transformed European science and society. It was part of the scientific revolution. However, nowadays we recognize that Newton's law of universal gravitation isn't strictly speaking true. It has been supplanted by other much more sophisticated theories, namely special and general relativity. So even though it was incredibly useful and there was lots of good reasons in the 17th century for adopting it as your view, that didn't mean that it was absolutely guaranteed to be true. So what we should be trying to do is doing our best to get at true beliefs. And the way that we best get at true beliefs is by trying to form beliefs that are well advanced, that have high levels of intersubjectively verifiable evidence and avoiding beliefs for which we don't have high levels of intersubjectively verifiable evidence. And an example of that kind of belief would be a belief in hyperoxygenation theory. Now, hyperoxygenation theory is supposed to be a treatment for cancer, but there literally is no evidence for it. It's a lot like hydroxychloroquine. There just isn't any clinical evidence to support that hydroxychloroquine, in fact, is an effective treatment for COVID. Just like there is no evidence to support that hyperoxygenation theory, in fact, is an effective treatment for cancer. And so if we form those beliefs, we're likely to make bad decisions. We're likely to waste money or time or to avoid more effective treatments in favor of this treatment and so on. 